In this video, we shall introduce certain preliminary concepts regarding antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and fibrinolytic or thrombolytic agents. <clears throat> now, when we talk about these drugs, it helps to have a good understanding about the concept of blood. Now, if we were to take a sample of blood from a patient, and if we were to send it to the lab for centrifugation, we would see that the cells would settle at the bottom while the plasma exists as a supernatant on top. The cells consist of WBCs, RBCs and platelets while the plasma consists of a straw colored fluid consisting of about 93% water. But it also contains a number of proteins, fats and sugars. Among the proteins, one particular type of protein is of importance to us in this particular discussion and they are the coagulation proteins, the clotting factors. Now the platelets are cells and they are produced from the bone marrow by the process of hematopoiesis and they are involved in hemostasis. The coagulation factors or clotting factors are proteins. They are produced from the liver by the process of transcription and translation and they are also involved in the process of hemostasis. Now let us turn our attention uh, more closely to the process of hemostasis. Now whenever an, an injury of sufficient severity occurs to the blood vessels, blood is lost from the circulatory system and the human body has evolved elaborate mechanisms to prevent or limit the loss of blood from the circulatory system. This mechanism is what we refer to as hemostasis. Hemostasis is achieved by several mechanisms, the simplest of which is vasoconstriction. Platelets get activated and they form a platelet plug. This limits the loss of blood from the circulatory system. This is referred to as primary hemostasis. Coagulation factors or clotting factors also get activated and they form a fibrin mesh. This is referred to as secondary hemostasis. Finally, the injury in the blood vessel heals by fibrosis. So, platelets are involved in primary hemostasis while coagulation factors or clotting factors are involved in secondary hemostasis. Now, hemostasis gets triggered in the presence of vascular injury or endothelial injury. As a result of primary and secondary hemostasis, blood stops flowing normally at the site of endothelial injury. In fact, a solid hemostatic plug is formed consisting of the platelet plug and the fibrin mesh. Now it's very important for us to understand that even while all this occurs at the site of endothelial damage, blood must continue to flow normally everywhere else where there is no endothelial damage. Under normal circumstances, the body should be able to initiate hemostasis where it is required and prevent hemostasis where it is not required. If hemostasis were to occur unnecessarily, the result would be prothrombotic disorders, like for example ischemic heart disease, ischemic stroke, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, peripheral arterial occlusive diseases, atrial fibrillation and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So, how does the human body decide where hemostasis should occur and where it should not occur? Let us assume that this is a cross section of a blood vessel. The blue lines represent the endothelium. Deep to the endothelium is the subendothelial collagen or collagen, however you want to pronounce it. Now, as long as the endothelium is intact and the subendothelial collagen is not exposed, 
the intact endothelium is going to release inhibitors of hemostasis. So the intact healthy endothelium releases inhibitory substances and as long as the endothelium is healthy and intact, blood is maintained in the fluid state. Consider however a situation where the endothelium is damaged. As you can see the subendothelial collagen is exposed and this causes the activation of hemostasis. A platelet plug is formed and it is supported by a fibrin mesh. Now in time, the damaged endothelium will heal by fibrosis and once this occurs, as you can see over here, the hemostatic plug is no longer necessary. In fact, if it persists, it could lead to complications later and therefore under normal conditions the clot should undergo a, a process called dissolution and dissolution is carried out by the fibrinolytic or the thrombolytic pathway. So as you can see the endothelium has healed by fibrosis and therefore this hemostatic plug has no business to persist over there. The liver produces a protein called plasminogen the endothelium produces a protein called tissue plasminogen activator. Tissue plasminogen activator is supposed to activate plasminogen but as long as plasminogen remains free in the plasma, the ability of tissue plasminogen activator to activate plasminogen is very very poor. On the other hand, if plasminogen is bound to fibrin, Tissue plasminogen activator can very very effectively convert plasminogen to plasmin which in turn causes dissolution of the clot. So in the absence of endothelial damage, the intact endothelium will release various inhibitors of primary and secondary hemostasis but if the endothelium is damaged, there is exposure of the subendothelial collagen and this causes activation of primary and secondary hemostasis resulting in the formation of a platelet plug and a fibrin mesh. Once hemostasis is achieved, the vessel heals by fibrosis. The clot is no longer required and should be got rid of by the process of dissolution and this takes place with the help of the fibrinolytic or the thrombolytic pathway. As we discussed, in pathological conditions, the patient tends to develop hemostatic tendencies unnecessarily. And this pathological tendency to develop clots or thrombi is referred to as thrombosis. There are three predisposing factors that tend to make the patient more predisposed to development of thrombi. This triad of predisposing factors is called virtue triad. They include endothelial injury, hypercoagulability of blood and abnormal blood flow. These can act singly or in combination to predispose the patient to a prothrombotic state. Now we know that normal blood flow is laminar blood flow. Anything that disrupts this sort of blood flow could cause either stasis or turbulence of blood flow. The classical example for a cause for stasis of blood is atrial fibrillation. Endothelial injury is classically caused by dyslipidemia and systemic inflammatory disorders. More recently, there is increasing evidence that COVID-19 also is capable of producing endothelial injury as well as hypercoagulability of blood. Now from a practical point of view, pathological thrombi may be of two types arterial and venous. Arterial thrombi tend to be more occlusive in nature while venous thrombi tend to be embolic in nature. They embolize. Now, when arterial thrombi occlude coronary arteries, the patient ends up with a ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction. 
vena arterial thrombi occlude the blood vessels that supply the brain like for example the vertebral artery the cerebral artery or indeed the carotid arteries the patient can end up with an ischemic stroke when arterial thrombi occlude the femoral or cochleal arteries the patient ends up with a peripheral arterial occlusive disease venous thrombi more commonly develop in the deep veins of the leg from where they embolize to cause pulmonary embolism management of various prothrombotic disorders involves the administration of antiplatelet drugs anticoagulants and thrombolytics otherwise called fibrinolytic drugs these are administered in various regimens and various protocols for both the prevention and treatment of prothrombotic disorders we will continue this discussion in the next video